In the name of the holy, consubstantial, undivided, ever and ever-living Trinity, one God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. When I was in high school in the last century, my high school guidance counselor had a big poster on the wall in his office. And the poster read, be alert. The country needs more alerts. <laughs> I know you'd, you'd get it. It would take just a moment. That's one of the principal messages in the parable that Jesus tells this morning. He wants all of you to be alerts. He wants you to be ready. He wants you to be doing. He wants you actively engaged in that ministry that he has laid out. Once again, where are we in the story? If you looked, you saw we're at Matthew 25, the beginning of the 25th chapter. There are only 27 chapters in Matthew. This is very near the end of Jesus' earth, earthly ministry. In fact, in just a few more verses, we're going to be getting to the Last Supper, the betrayal, Jesus' passion, and crucifixion. This is the last parable that he tells us. This is the last parable that he wants to share with a broader audience. This is almost his final statement, other than, of course, his statements to Pilate and Herod and his words on the cross. So it takes on an added significance. This is also the last time that Matthew gets to talk to us that way. Matthew, I'm not saying he puts words in Jesus' mouth, but he has arranged the things that Jesus has been saying and doing as he recalls them years after his death and resurrection. And, and Matthew puts this here as a way of kind of summing up all that has gone before. It's interesting if you think about this a little bit, Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding feast in Cana. And the last parable is at a wedding banquet once again. Weddings sort of run throughout Matthew's gospel. And this is sort of a way of summing up and tying things together for that evangelist. I should probably just give you a, a few words to describe what a first century wedding in Cana would have looked like. That's a little bit different than the way we do it. Uh, first of all, people came from far and wide. Your extended family and lots of friends would come from out of town. And of course, they weren't flying in or driving in. They had to travel mostly on foot. The wealthy ones maybe could ride in a cart or on some animal, usually a donkey. But they came early, not just like early the day of the wedding, but early that week. So your guests would start to arrive several days before the actual wedding ceremony. And then they would have the wedding and it would be overseen by a rabbi or some other leader of the church. And then things change here a little bit because then everybody goes home after the ceremony and the bride goes back to her family home with her parents. The groom goes back to his home with his parents and there's a little period of waiting while the wedding banquet is prepared. And the banquet is always in the evening. It always comes after dark. It's part of the tradition. And it's not just a single meal. The banquet will go on for several days. This is why in that story that I referenced about Jesus turning water into wine at his first miracle at, at, at the wedding in Cana. It wasn't because they drank so much in a short time it was gone, but when Jesus performed that miracle, it was probably the second or third or even later, uh, a later date in, in the wedding celebration because it would go on, go on for days and days. So the other part of this story that's important and it comes to play in the parable that Jesus tells is that along with the, with, with the bride going back to her home after the ceremony, her close friends would go with her. Uh, the new Revised Standard Version uses the word bridesmaids. That's, that's, a, that's a modern word. That, that's not what it would have been like. These are just her friends. Uh, you know, if we would, her roommates from college 
her childhood friends that she grew up with. These are the people who would come to be with her. And then they would wait with her until the bridegroom came to fetch her. And he would come after dark and then all of her friends carried torches. Again, NRSV says lamps. Lamps were used indoors, not outdoors. Torches would be a better translation. But anyway, they would dip their torches. Remember, torches are usually wrapped with cloth on the end. And they would dip them into oil, light them, and then they would surround the happy couple, the bride and the groom, and they would light them on their way through the streets of the city. Remember, this is a time there was no light after dark. The only light outdoors was from the stars or from the moon, perhaps, if it was out. So it was not only as a way of protecting them and keeping them safe and surrounding them with light, but it showed the whole community that this was the bridal party on their way to celebrate. So what happens in our story here today is some of the maids, some of the friends of the brides, brought enough oil to make sure that it lasted because the bridegroom was delayed. It got dark in the house and just think about teenage girls. If they had a chance to light a torch in the house, they would. And they kind of used up their oil and they didn't have enough and they just wasn't enough to share and they were left behind. And then they kind of finally get caught up and go, you know, I don't know, they got Amazon one hour delivery and got the oil that came to them and then they were able to join. And then the doors were closed and shut and the bridegroom says, no, I don't even know who you are. You missed your chance, you're too late. And, and at the first reading, it just sounds like we need to be awake, we need to be watchful, we need to be ever vigilant for, for Christ's second coming, for his great and triumphant return. Well, we'd all be pretty tired by now if we were staying awake for that. Most of us would have run out of oil long ago in the 2,000 years that we've been waiting and we haven't seen him yet. So what does it really tell us about what we should be doing? Most of us aren't and haven't for a very long time, if ever, been young girls. Most of us have not been at a wedding like this. What's the point that Jesus is trying to make? Well, what Jesus is asking us, what Jesus is telling us, that he needs us to be alert because the church needs more alerts. The church needs more people who have read the gospel, who have lived the gospel, who believe the gospel, who share the gospel. We have been given this good news. Remember the word gospel means good news. We have been given this good news of God and Jesus Christ. We have been given the good news of a savior who came into the world to help save everyone to free us from the bondage of sin, to lift up the downtrodden, to heal the brokenhearted, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to give water to the thirsty. All of that is part and parcel of the good news. All of us are called by Jesus to be participants in sharing the good news, not only in telling the story, although that is vitally important, more on telling the story in a moment, not only in sharing the story and telling the story for its importance, but in sharing the good works that Jesus called on us to do. Jesus who literally bent down and touched the people that he healed. Jesus who deliberately went out of his way to get food for the hungry and, and water for the thirsty. Jesus who went out of his way to comfort the grieving and the sorrowful. Jesus who went off his path to meet the people who called out to him for help. Jesus gave the listening ear. Jesus gave the comforting words. Jesus gave the shoulder to cry on. Jesus gave the shoulder to lean on. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do in this parable. Not just to sit with a bucket of oil and a lamp ready to run out the door just in case he happened to show up in the middle of the night, but to say, what have you been doing to be prepared? What have you been doing that I asked you to do? Just as these young maidens knew they were supposed to have enough oil to be able to, to guide the bride and groom to the wedding banquet, we know that we have been given a job, that we need to be alert, that we need to be ready, that we need to be working, that we need to be preparing the way. 
We become the light to the world that brings the light of Jesus Christ to others. We become the torchbearers. We become those who accompany those who need to see in the darkness, who are lacking in hope, who are lacking in confidence, who are lacking in the basic things of daily life. We are to be accompanying them and showing them the light of Jesus Christ, the light of the good news, the light of the gospel, the light of salvation, the light of hope, the light of God's love. That's what alert does. That's what alert is called to be. That is why Jesus calls us all to be alerts, because the church and the world around us desperately needs those who can bring the light, who can bring the hope, who can bring the comfort, who can bring the peace, who can bring the love to this broken world, to this darkened world, to this sometimes very scary world. We are bearers of the light and bearers of the good news. We are called to do that job, to be ready for when Jesus comes back so that more and more people will walk with him into that glorious banquet hall in heaven. That's our job, to share, to lift up, to support, to proclaim to be evangelists, to be bringers of good news. Be alert. The church desperately needs more alerts.